Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. Understanding a Christ-centered ministry. Now, some of you here sitting might be thinking, oh, Christ-centered ministry. Oh, okay, so that's for those evangelists and the pastors and the elders and the full-time workers and, um, and so on and so forth. That doesn't apply to me. Well, I want to remind you that ministry is not just for a few select people. If you are a believer, if you are a Christian, then Ministry is given to you as well. Ephesians 4.12, it talks about the elders and the job of the elders ultimately is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's to equip the believers so that they can do the ministry. So ministry, it is for full-time workers, it's for the elders and the pastors, and it's for each one of you. And that's why this message is for each one of you sitting here, even as I've titled it, A Christ-Centered Ministry. We left off last, last week. We looked at verses 21 to 23. And the last exhortation there, the condition that Paul laid out to us and the, the encouragement towards us was to continue to persevere in the faith, to persevere in the gospel, to to continue to live it out, to continue to proclaim it, to continue to hold on to it, to continue to cling on to Christ so that the way you live shows forth Christ as most supreme and most precious. And in this passage that we read, really, Paul focuses on himself. And you have to wonder at at the start, why is he doing this? Just before this, we looked at that hymn that talked about the grandeur of Christ and the supremacy of Christ. And then he says, okay, let me tell you how it's applied to you, how Christ's supremacy is applied to you. And then he says, you, you were in this state, and this is what Christ has done, and this is where you're heading. And then he says, me. Why? You see, Paul is trying to counter a heresy that is coming up in the church. And the heresy is saying Christ is good, but he's not, he's not enough. Other things need to be added. That, yes, the gospel that you heard about Jesus Christ, about his person and his work, is good. But, you know, we've got these other things that you need to know about, so the false teachers were saying. And so Paul writes this letter, and he starts off by saying, listen, what you have, the gospel, it is powerful. Christ and his work is powerful. And so he thanks God for what he sees, the gospel work that is going on in the church, and he thanks God for that. And then he says, listen, this work is so powerful, so I'm going to pray that God would continue to give you the grace to continue on in this work. And then, as he's thinking about it, he thinks of the Son and he says, Christ Jesus, the eternal Son of God, he is powerful, he's supreme, and therefore he's sufficient for all your needs. There is no one else that you need. And he says, if that's not enough, then look at your own life. Look at your past life and look at where you are right now. Is that not evidence that this gospel is powerful? That Christ and his work is powerful? But then there's a problem. You see, this man, Paul, is writing from a prison. He's saying this is God's powerful work, and yet when the false teachers are looking at them, and the church is looking at them, he's cooped up in a little dungeon, in a little prison. 
How is this gospel powerful? How is Christ and his work powerful? And so Paul now, thinking of that, he wants to encourage them. He wants to encourage them by saying, look at my own life, what's happening in my life. Christ is still powerful. His his work is still powerful. And so he wants to immunize them against this false teaching that's coming in. And he wants them to continue to stand firm, to continue to persevere in the gospel to persevere in that life and portray Christ as most precious and continue to serve Christ. So we come to understanding a Christ-centered ministry looks like through the example of the Apostle Paul. And I have two points The first one is from verse 24, and that's the perspective in Christ-centered ministry. And secondly, the calling in Christ-centered ministry, and that's in verse 25. We'll spend the majority of our time in point one because there's a lot there, and it's probably one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament, perhaps, Uh, So we need to spend some time, particularly in verse 24. So bulk of our time will be in point one, and then we'll look at point two. So firstly, the perspective that we are to have in Christ-centered ministry. Look at verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Paul begins by saying, I rejoice in my sufferings. Sufferings. It's not in the singular, it's in the plural. My various sufferings, not just one suffering, the multitude of sufferings. Paul was someone who was acquainted with suffering. You know, at the start of his ministry as an apostle, this is what the Lord says of Paul as he speaks to Ananias in Acts 9, 16. For I will show him how he must suffer for the sake of my name. For I will show him how he must suffer for the sake of my name. And that's even before he started his ministry. And suffer he did during the course of his ministry. If you want a glimpse a CV, so to say, of his ministry, uh, just turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 28. Let me just read this. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 28. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at the sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul was a man acquainted with sufferings. And look at where he's writing from. He's like I said, he's, he's writing from a dingy Roman prison. Colossians 4.3 says, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And just look down at verse 10 again as he ends this letter. Colossians 4.10 I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Remember my chains and pray for me. 
So Paul was well acquainted with suffering. His ministry was marked by suffering. But, but, here, but here's the astounding part. Look at his attitude. Look back at Colossians 1.24 again. I rejoice in my suffering. He's not saying I rejoice in spite of my sufferings. Oh, I'm going to, re- you know, there's this thing called suffering and it's there, but, you know, I'm going to try and rejoice. No, he's saying I rejoice in my sufferings. At first sight, it might think like, what is he, uh, some kind of masochist? You know, somebody who delights in pain and suffering? No, he, he, he wasn't a pain junkie. See, the suffering was not an end in itself. And verse 24 gives us a reason for the joy for why he's rejoicing in his suffering. Paul says he's suffering for your sake. Further in the verse, he adds, for the sake of the body, the church. He's saying for the sake of the Colossian church, who are part of the body of Christ, the universal church, he is suffering. He's suffering for the Colossians, that local church, and he's suffering for the universal church, the church at large. But how is he suffering for a church that he's never met? Remember when we looked through the first few verses? This church was planted by Epaphras. And he's the one who founded the church, and and Paul is just simply writing this letter to them. He's never seen this church. So how is he suffering for the sake of a church that he's never met? See, Paul was commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles. And he would be, when he'd preach the word of God, when he'd preach the gospel, he would be opposed by the Gentiles. Because he would confront their pagan ways. And say, no, that's not the true God. This is the true and living God. You're worshipping idols. This is the true and living God, Christ the Messiah. But he'd be opposed by the Jews as well, because they didn't like the fact that he was going around and saying that salvation is now available to these pagans, to these Gentiles. That these Gentiles were also part of God's plan. See, the Colossian church, they were predominantly Gentile. And so what Paul is saying is his sufferings were as a result of his ministry to the Gentiles. And the Colossian church was a part of it. His sufferings, in fact, and it continued to spread the gospel to the rest of the Gentile population. In fact, if you even think of it, even now, Paul's suffering has been a benefit for us. No one here is a Jew. Everyone here is a Gentile. And yet we have this letter that we're edified by, by, that we are built up by, which causes us to be reminded of the gospel, and perhaps some will be saved as well. So Paul is suffering for the sake of the church, and he's rejoicing. But you'd still say, wow, that's still a tall order. Now, the second half of the verse explains why Paul has this perspective of joyfully suffering for the sake of the church. Let's read on. Paul says, And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. What does that mean? I mean, just... To think that there is something lacking in Christ's affliction? Wasn't Christ's atoning work sufficient? Then how can there be a lack in Christ's afflictions? And how can Paul, a mere mortal, fill up what is lacking in Christ's affliction? See, the Roman Catholic Church uses this verse to say that Jesus' atoning work on the cross, it was very good. 
And it was sufficient for the sins right up to the time the person becomes a Catholic. But for future sins from then on, there has to be another way. And so they say you have things like penance and purgatory, both forms of some form of suffering. What they say is, see, we still sin in this life even after we become Catholic. And so you need penance, you need to suffer, you need to fast, you need to give alms and prayers and, and a whole bunch of other things where you'd suffer and there's some merit to that. And your sins are absolved through that. And if you die without absolving those sins, without confessing those sins, then you go and go to a place where you have an opportunity to suffer again. And a lot more suffering, and somehow that suffering at purgatory will gain some merit and get you to heaven. Now the Catholic Church also says, the, you know, the saints, the, the super spiritual ones, not in the way that Paul uses the saints. The saints are really just a term for every Christian because every Christian is set apart for Christ. But according to the Catholic Church, the, 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 su- the super saints, those who live an exceptionally holy life, an exceptionally pious life, uh, and perhaps some of these saints were those who got martyred What they say is that these saints have some extra piety and extra merit because of their sufferings, because of the way they lived their life, because of the way they got martyred. And so that extra merit goes into a treasury of merit that belongs to the church. And frail sinners like you and I can have access to that either by giving arms or doing other things. And that's where the whole indulgences thing came about. But let me submit to you, this is not what the Bible teaches. This is not Christianity. This is heresy. And it's certainly not what Colossians 1.24 is saying. See, why? Because even the first few verses, right up to verse 23 of this chapter, we've gone through it, and Paul is emphasizing how Jesus is supreme over everything and therefore is sufficient. Colossians 1.20, we saw how Christ's death on the cross, through him, all things have been reconciled back to God. And last week we saw from verses 21 to 23 how Christ has reconciled you. It's already been done. And because he has reconciled you, you can be assured that you will stand blameless and holy before God on judgment day. Nothing else need to be added by our works, by our sufferings, or by someone else's works, or someone else's suffering. See, it was the false teachers, really. The false teachers that were saying that Christ is good, his suffering is good, but you need to add more things. Christ, uh, Paul is not at all saying that. He's saying he is sufficient, he's supreme. And, and look, it's not just Paul who says this. If you look at other parts of Scripture, it's the same thing. Christ himself on the cross just before he gave up the spirit. What did he say? It is finished. The work is complete. The work is sufficient. If you move on in Colossians, you'll, this fact is continued to be emphasized. Christ in his person and his work is indeed sufficient to save us and to mature us. You look at Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 11 and 12. It reads, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. See, no priest could sit down. In fact, there was no place to sit down. Why? Because the sacrifices were never ending. There had to be repeated sacrifices 
for the sins of the people. And so a priest could never sit down. But what Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 is saying is that Christ offered himself as the perfect, sufficient sacrifice. It was sufficient. No more sacrifices have to be made. The work was complete. And having completed the work, having finished the work, Jesus, as now the high priest, sits down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus' atoning work is sufficient and is complete. There is nothing lacking in his atoning work. Okay, so, but that still leaves us with the problem of Colossians 1.24 that says, there's something lacking in Christ's affliction. Now turn to Philippians 2, 29 and 30, because here in this passage, the same words lacking and filling up or completing is used. And we get a clue to what uh, it might mean in our text. Philippians 2, 29 and 30. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor. And honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service. Did you catch that? He risked his life to complete, to fill, it's the same word, what was lacking in your service to me. So is Paul saying here that somehow their, their service to him, the service of the Colossian church was lacking, was insufficient? No, not at all. Look at Philippians 4, 14 to 18. It'll give us a fuller picture of the Philippian service. Philippians 4, 14 to 18. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you send me help for my needs once and again. But not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more, and I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So is he saying their gifts toward him were insufficient? No, he's saying, in fact, none of the other churches supported me in my ministry. You were the only church, the poor church, that supported me all along. You continue to support me. You continue to uh, give. And, and this gift that you've given me through Epaphroditus, that is fully sufficient, even more than I need. Now come back to Philippians 2.30. So as he talks about Epaphroditus, He's saying he is filling up or completing what is lacking in your service. What is lacking? Well, their service, this gift was available to them. It was right there. But the gift hadn't reached him. The gift, if it just stays there, does no good to Paul. It's still lacking. Not that it's insufficient. It's just sitting there. But it needs to come from there, and it needs to come to him. So this messenger, risking his own life, completes what's lacking, fills what's lacking, and he brings the gift over to him. Now back to Colossians 1.24. Paul is saying he's completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Paul in his flesh is filling up what is lacking in Christ, meaning Paul in his body is 
through his suffering and through his proclaiming, he is presenting Christ. You see, what is lacking is Christ's afflictions, the message, the preciousness, the value, the benefit of Christ's afflictions. It's just sitting there. Now somebody has to take it and take it to the Gentiles and take it to the world. And so now Paul completes it. He completes what is lacking. Not that Christ's afflictions are insufficient. It is fully sufficient. But he completes what's lacking. So Paul is proclaiming the beauty of the afflictions of Christ. And he fulfills what is lacking. But what's the connection between Paul's suffering and making the gospel known to others? Now, I want you to turn to one more passage. And I think this will really help us understand all that's going on here. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 12. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 12. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. And note this, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. See, on the one side, Paul is saying from this passage, people who are entrusted with the gospel, they're like jars of clay. They have no beauty to themselves. They're insignificant. They're just, just common. And they, undergo, and they undergo persecutions and trials. And what do these persecutions and trials show? They, they point away from the messenger because there's no beauty in them. But it points to God. When people are changed, it points to the fact that this powerful gospel that they have in them is powerful and it points to God. But he's also saying that when those entrusted with the gospel proclaim the gospel, and when they suffer, even through that, they are in a sense proclaiming the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.10 again. Paul is saying that he sees his suffering in some sense as a picture of Jesus' death. When he suffers, there's the picture of Jesus' life. So what does all this mean? It means that the person entrusted with the gospel, when they proclaim the preciousness and the value of Christ's afflictions, as they do that, and as opposition comes, and there's suffering, in that suffering that they undergo, they embody the suffering servant. They embody Christ. They embody the life of Christ. Their very life reflects Jesus Christ while they suffer. When they proclaim the beauties of the sufferings of Christ, and as they are persecuted, they embody it in word and in deed, in action through their suffering. They point to the suffering Messiah. In what they proclaim, they proclaim the suffering Messiah. Do you see that?
Paul is saying that when you suffer for the gospel, that suffering reflects Christ, the very life of Christ, that life of persecution. His sufferings are on display for the people to see. And in some sense, the sufferings that you and I undergo through serve as a display of the suffering servant. But why is this even possible? That we, through our sufferings, are able to even point to the sufferings of Christ. Again, it's because of our union with Christ. We've been talking about that a few times as we've gone through Colossians, and we'll keep coming across that. The being in Christ. See, turn to Acts 9.4. If you, if you remember, when Saul, the, the religious Pharisee, who was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, as he goes on his way, Christ stops him in his tracks, and this is what he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who is he going to persecute? He's going to persecute the church. Who is Christ saying he's persecuting? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you see that? Do you see the connection there? That union there? So when we suffer, we point to the sufferings of Christ. And really, in a sense, Christ suffers because of that union with Christ. And that's what the Christian life is all about, isn't it? Matthew 16, 24 to 25, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The life, the Christian life, Our service to God, our ministry is a life of self-denial. It's that cross-centered life. And that life, as we are persecuted, as we suffer, as we stand for the truth, as we proclaim the sufferings of Christ, even in our suffering, we have the privilege to point to the sufferings of That's why Paul's rejoicing. Do you see why he's rejoicing? Because he's saying, see, it's not only that I get to proclaim the gospel about the afflictions of Christ, but when I'm persecuted, when I suffer, when I am confronted by the world, Even through that, even through those sufferings, I get to reflect the suffering servant. See, what the false teachers were trying to do, they were trying to disqualify the saints that were at Colossae. They were being persecuted, really, because this false teaching was coming. Because they were looking at these precious Christians, and they were saying, listen, you're walking this path, but listen, you need to add some more. You need to do this, and you need to do that. And they're being tempted to sway this way or that way. And if they did stand firm, the more they stand firm, the more these false teachers are coming and saying, no, you're disqualified. You can't be a full, mature Christian this way. No, this is so different from the world, isn't it? The worldly life. 
and especially the Australian culture that we live in, where the end goal is what? Is, is pleasure and comfort. That's what we live for. And avoiding any kind of suffering. Now, now I, I want to clarify, we can suffer for many things. You know, it could be uh, some foolish thing that we did and we suffer because of that, because of our sinfulness. Uh, could be a whole bunch of things. But particularly in this context, as people who are entrusted with the gospel, as we stand firm, and as we consider it a joy to proclaim Jesus Christ, when we suffer, don't be disheartened. Don't wallow. Consider it a privilege. Because you get to, in your suffering, you get to point to the suffering servant. This is the perspective of a Christ-centered ministry. This is the perspective that every Christian must have. Now, if you're wondering, but really, every Christian? I mean, are you sure? Maybe some Christians? Let's look at then our second point. The calling of Christ-centered ministry. The calling of Christ-centered ministry. Paul says, of which, verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Paul says, I became a minister, of which I became a minister. Of what? Of the church. I became a minister of the church. Why is he a minister of the church? Because he's a minister of the gospel. A minister of the gospel is a slave of Jesus Christ. And if you and I are slaves of Jesus Christ, the head, then we automatically become ministers of the church as well. You see, because if, you're se- if you say, no, 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 I serve Jesus, but I don't serve the church, you're dividing the head and the body. But the church is the body of Christ, and we serve Christ by serving the body. Paul says, I became a minister. I became, I was brought into existence. At at one point in time, I became a minister. And why did he become a minister of the gospel, a minister of the church? Paul says he became a minister of a servant of the church according to the stewardship of God. It wasn't because he was brilliant. It wasn't because of his Jewish credentials. It wasn't because of his training under the Jewish elite who, you know, like Gamaliel and everyone else who trained him so well to understand the Old Testament. It wasn't because of his personality. It wasn't because of his zeal. In fact, he was the very one who was persecuting the church, and we just looked at that before. But now he became a minister of the church, and it was according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now we'll deal with that last phrase to make the word of God fully known next week, but look at what Paul is saying here in the rest of the verse. Paul is saying, I was given a stewardship from God for you. A stewardship from God. 
What's a steward? A, a steward was someone who managed something for somebody else. You know, it was usually a, a, a large estate or a, or a large household. It's the idea of a, of a manager. He didn't own anything, but this person was to look after the household on behalf of the, the owner or the master of the household. He was given that charge by the, by the master of the house. And so there was an obligation or a responsibility to carry out what was entrusted to him. He just couldn't do whatever he liked, but he specifically given the stewardship of taking care of the household. And so he had to obey, he had to submit and fulfill that responsibility. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, it is required of servants that they be found trustworthy. See, because it's, it's such a huge task, right? Because the master of the household is entrusting this, whatever it is, the household to you. And so you are to be found trustworthy. This is a, an entrustment. So Paul is saying here, his ministry is a stewardship. What he has been entrusted with is to take care of the church, the household of God. It's a stewardship from God. It's from God, a stewardship from God. Let the gravity of that sink in. The king of this universe is trusting you with something. He's entrusting you with something. He's saying, I'm entrusting you with this ministry. And this ministry is to serve the church. And Paul understood this well. He didn't take the ministry for granted. Why? Because he knew it wasn't something that he deserved. God had entrusted him with the ministry because it was God's own grace toward him. Ephesians 3, to it's a parallel passage to this, says this, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. It's a stewardship of God's grace given. I love uh, this description that Paul gives in 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 14. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief and, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that I in Christ Jesus. See, the ministry, the stewardship of ministry that is given by God is simply because of God's grace and mercy. But notice also the stewardship of ministry is given by God and it's for you. It's for your benefit. It's not for me. It's not for my gain. It's not for my reputation. The stewardship that is given to me is for the benefit of the church. I mean, what a trust ministry is, isn't it? For us to serve the Lord for the benefit of the church. And I'd say Paul understood this well as a minister of the gospel and as a minister of the church. Now in case you tuned out when I started, and some of you are still thinking, okay, great, Benoit. In everything that you've said, we've heard so far, okay, it's for ministers, for the pastors and the elders and the evangelists and the full-time workers. No, see, the word minister here, it's not used in the official sense of minister as we would hear it today, as a, as a title. It means a servant. It's the same word that's used of Epaphras in Colossians 1-2, and we looked at that. Every Christian who is a servant of Jesus Christ is also a servant of his body, the church. 
and really serving the body, it's a stewardship issue. Because of the grace and mercy that is given to you. Because you weren't always like this. You were once hostile, alienated from God. Now you've been reconciled. You know, Titus 1.7, it talks about overseers, and it's referring to elders and pastors, and they're called as God's stewards of the church. But every Christian is also called a steward. 1 Peter 4.10. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. See, God is the one who gifts, gifts us with the ministry to serve the church. And if you are a Christian, then you are in some form uniquely gifted to serve the church. And it would be wrong for you to not use that gift. But it would also be wrong for you to use that gift to promote yourself. And whatever unique way God has gifted you, you are to use it for the benefit of the church. Now, some of you might be thinking, but I don't, I don't know what my gift is. I would say just to start serving. Serving in any shape or form. Because really, that's what ministry is. Ministering to one another, serving one another. It's service. You can start by inviting people over to your house, encouraging one another by praying for one another. That's ministering to one another. That's serving the church. Now perhaps there are some of you here thinking, you know, you've been faithfully serving the church and uh, things are going well and I encourage you to continue to do that. You're being a good steward of what God has called you as, even as a gospel minister. But perhaps there are some of you who have been serving in the church and you don't feel like serving anymore. It may be because somebody criticized you about the way you did ministry. Something about that. Maybe you haven't been appreciated. Maybe because your ministry has always been behind behind the scenes. And maybe for some reason, because of the pressures of life or whatever else, just serving has become a burden. If that is you, let me encourage you to change your thinking, change your focus off that. And focus on the privilege of serving the church. Remind yourself that ministry is a gift of God's grace. It is not given to serve yourself, but it is given to serve the church and to build up the church. You were once hostile to God, and now God gives you the privilege of serving him by serving the church. And how are you to serve him? By denying yourself. So that when others see you, when you continue to reflect Christ and there's some opposition and you're denying yourself, you are continuing to point to the suffering servant. That's Christ-centered ministry. That's the Christ-centered Christian life. Christ wants. People who follow Christ, imitate Christ. But even more basic than that, let me just say this. God has given us all one gift that is common to all believers. You want to know what that is? That's the gospel. He has entrusted you and he has entrusted me and everyone who's a believer with the gospel. 
And it is not so that we hold it in and, uh, and keep it in lock and key somewhere, but it's the very opposite. That we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the preciousness of the afflictions of Jesus Christ. That's what Matthew 18, Matthew 28, 18 to 20 is, isn't it? Jesus' last words to his disciples before, after he's resurrected and before he goes up to heaven. Let me just read that quickly. And Jesus came and said to him, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. See, that's not given to just the elders or the full-time workers or the evangelists. It's given to all of Jesus' disciples to proclaim the gospel, whether locally or internationally. Whether as a full-time missionary who wants to uh, go overseas or as someone who lives here in Melbourne, studying or working or retirement or retired or even a homemaker. We're all called to proclaim the gospel to those around us who do not believe in Jesus. To family members, to neighbors, to workmates, the, that, that longtime friend that does not know Jesus, the, the hairdresser or, or the barber, the, the local store cashier, whoever else that we come in contact with that don't know the good news of Jesus Christ. Will there be opposition? Will there, will there be affliction? Most likely. But that should be expected. But you and I should rejoice at that affliction, at that suffering, because both through the proclamation of the gospel and through the suffering and the persecution, you are pointing others to the suffering servant. This is our privilege. This is our universal call. This is our Christ-centered ministry. Let me just end with a, with, a, with a story that I think some of you would know, a real story, something that happened. It was the year 1965, and a young Queenslander named Graham Staines, he had a close friend named Satanu Satpati, all the way in India, in Orissa. They had been pen pals for many years, since childhood. And in 65, he, Graham Staines, this young Queenslander, he goes to visit his friend in India, in Orissa. And he never left. For nearly 35 years, Graham Staines, he lived and worked with some of the poorest communities in Orissa. And it wasn't just community work that he did, that he would serve them this way and he would go on and continue to proclaim the gospel. Did he have opposition? Was there struggle? Oh yeah, there was. That didn't stop him. In fact, it was on 22nd January 1999, he was on his way to proclaim the gospel at a village a bit far away. And because it was a long journey, he stopped midway. He's 58 years old at this point. And two sons of his, Philip, who was 10, and Timothy, who was 9, are with him. And they decide to spend the night in the car. Do you know what happened to them? The activists poured kerosene on that car. And burnt them alive. From what I can gather, 
As a result of that, many have come to know the suffering servant. So let me ask you, Christian, this morning, what is your view of ministry? Your view cannot be anything other than a Christ-centered ministry. And if it is a Christ-centered ministry, then with joy go and proclaim the afflictions of Christ, the sufferings of Christ. And as you face opposition, Know that even those oppositions, those sufferings, through that you are pointing to him. Now even those of you here, let me encourage you, because even as I think Paul is saying as a minister of the church, there is a sense in which uh, 2 Timothy, I think it's in chapter 3, where he says, "I, I minister for the sake of the elect, which is the church. So essentially he's saying, listen, I don't know who's going to come to know the Lord or not. Either way, I'm serving for the elect, for God's people. And I do that by proclaiming the gospel to everyone so that more would be added to God's family. And I pray that we would have this mindset. And so... Even when we serve here, as we, so whether it's to unbelievers, to bring them into the household, or whether it's here amongst ourselves, serving each other, when somebody irks you, or you're being faithful and because of some discouragement or because somebody says something, don't be tempted to quit. Because it really is a privilege. Let's pray together. Father, we recognize that the very fact that we can serve you and serve Christ, whether it's within this local body or the the greater church, or serving you by proclaiming the gospel and bringing others into your fold, We pray that oftentimes we see the opposition and the struggle and we run away from it. And yet, Father, thank you for reminding us that even through that suffering, that it is expected, that it is not abnormal, but it is the very means by which the gospel is proclaimed. And so I pray, Father, that for each one here, including myself, that we would be faithful to you, that we would be faithful to serve Christ, that we would be faithful to proclaim Jesus Christ in our words, in our deeds, in our sufferings, so that all the world would see how supreme and sufficient and precious you are. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen.